Welcome to the session. So now we are finally starting with our second first talk in sustainability of AI. And first off, Duke Barton, welcome. He is from SURF, the Dutch National Research and Educational Research Network. Double research is always good. And yeah, we're really excited to hear your talk. Come up, the floor is yours. And yep. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, can I just, ah, the slide's coming up, I guess. <coughs> Good morning. Uh, well, great to be able to open this as a second first speaker or first second speaker. Um, I'm going to present something, uh, work that I've done with some colleagues. So keep in mind it's uh, a shared activity uh, about insights into sustainably managing a, a computer infrastructure. And uh, this is the computer infrastructure that you see in the background. It's the Dutch national supercomputer. So. Uh, all these days we've seen these slides, right, with, with a line going up, talking about either uh, energy demand or uh, computational demand, uh, because we talk about AI, and AI uses a lot of computation to either be trained or be used. Um, the Patterson et al. paper with GPT-3 estimating about 552 tons CO2 emission in its uh, training uh, is mentioned quite a bit. Uh, but next to that, there's, of course, this sort of broader idea about uh, sustainability, right? There's a lot of uh, elements to your organization, but also uh, uh, the systems themselves, the buildings in which they're housed. All of that is part of this idea of your um, footprint as, a, as, a, as an organization and as a service and as an IT system. Um, and there's much more than this, right? I mean, we also talked about social sustainability so far, uh, water uses, all those kinds of elements. Um, and this is going to be sort of a guiding lens for me to talk about a computer system that we have at the organization I work. Um, so where do I work? <laughs> I work at SURF. SURF is the Dutch National Research and Education Network, a, a non-profit cooperative of all the research institutions, educational institutions, and a place that's an internet service provider. We have services, we work uh, uh, very value-based, and we have the Dutch National Supercomputing Facility. Uh, and all of your countries that you're from have similar organizations like that. So I named a few, right? You have uh, DFN in Germany, uh, Garnet in Ghana, uh, Internet2 in the US. Um, all of these organizations do sort of similar uh, things. So let's get to it. A supercomputer. What then are we talking about? Um, this is about, I think, 16 server racks. And um, uh, they're used to build a supercomputer. And a supercomputer, in general, is a computer system that has the front line of processing technology and is used to um, do all kinds of computational tasks. So you can think of uh, um, simulating things that are usually too expensive or impossible or uh, dangerous or too extended, as in take too long of a time. So you have climate modeling, right? Uh, particle simulation, nuclear physics, astronomy, um, all of those. Research uh, topics require a lot of computation to get into their um, role of getting to insights and knowledge and um, uh, building their research. And in the Netherlands, we have one. It's called Snellius. It's uh, built in 2021. Um, and it has some fun facts, right? It's uh, six petaflops per second. Sounds impressive, I guess. I mean, it's a bit of a, a, a problem. <laughs> Hard to imagine what that means. It's not the greatest, uh, biggest supercomputer in the world. It's when it was launched, was somewhere in the around 300th place uh, of quickest supercomputers. Uh, but it was on the number six place uh, in the top green 500 uh, for the GPU partition, where we actually get about 29,000 gigaflops of calculation per watt. So you can see that a little bit as how much science can you do with what amount of energy, uh, and there's. Seems logical, right? You want to optimize that so you have less energy for the same amount of scientific insight that you sort of buy with that energy expenditure. Uh, and it's about five times more energy efficient than the predecessor, but it still uses a whole lot of uh, energy. Um, so when we bought it, we tried to take into account like corporate social responsibility, right? Do we, we want maybe have a green machine, a machine that's a little bit more efficient. You also see in general that most uh, supercomputing facilities take uh, environmental sustainability as one of their uh, main factors in uh, decision making about which system they will procure. Um, but as you can see, of course, 
performance is still the thing, the reason you buy the thing, so it's uh, usually one of the main uh, um, uh, drivers behind uh, buying uh, the system. And then, um, when we talk about this sort of impact it has on the environment, uh, I'm going to simplify all throughout my conversation uh, <laughs> presentation, so that at the end it's almost hard to say anything about anything at all. But in general, you have the thing in itself, right? The, the machine, and you have the usage of the machine. And those are the two main elements of its um, uh, impact on uh, the environment. Um, and actually, if uh, uh, you want to do this, the whole of this is quite difficult uh, uh, to estimate. So for this presentation, I've already reduced that down to the hardware of the machine and the energy it uses. That already misses a lot, right? Uh, it misses the uh, water consumption, it misses the building, it misses the whether or not the engineers working on a drive to work or not. All of those emissions we already ignore at this stage. Um, maybe to add to that, we do have a closed water loop system, so we actually do not use much water in the, in the use of the system, but uh, of course the building of the system itself at the manufacturer is uh, quite an impactful event. Um, so, <laughs> what then is in the system? So this is the time to nerd out, right? There's uh, about 17 Lenovo Think Systems SR665s uh, and all kinds of exciting stuff in there. Uh, most importantly, this is the first phase. We have about three and a half phases that we go through in building the system over the years. Um, and as you can see, in the current phase, there's about 36 uh, uh, server racks with um, uh, NVIDIA GPUs that are mostly aimed at, you, at, at doing machine learning tasks. And the other element is mostly CPUs, which are done for all other kinds of scientific simulations. Um, and um, my colleague, Leonike, she sadly left uh, the organization after we submitted our proposal, was uh, the person who uh, is our corporate social responsibility officer. So she dived into this element of what is then the carbon impact of such a system, right? It's its use, it's its hardware. Um, so she uh, did a whole project together with a, uh, a consult consulting firm trying to figure out, okay, if we have all these systems, can we estimate the carbon impact of building uh, um, that hardware system? And her estimation came to about uh, uh, 40,000 uh, yeah, 40, ton CO2 equivalent. So that's quite a bit, right? That's a lot. Further diving into that, and all of that is based on these uh, PAYA calculation sheets by the um, suppliers. So the suppliers also provide this based on an algorithm developed by MIT that they use to estimate what their actually their impact is in building these things. So it's not a measurement, it's not something that is tangible. All of it is already based on a sort of modeling of the real world. Uh, so I dove into it a bit, which lead, led me to for, oh yeah, so this is the product sheet, so you see already here, they say 18,000 plus minus about 6,000, right? So it's also on their side quite uh, an unclear uh, estimation. Uh, and also uh, I figured out we made some mistakes in our own analysis. So for this pre presentation, we're gonna be conservative and we're gonna double it just to you know, be sure that we don't miss anything important. Uh, and we are definitely on the, you know, high side probably. So that's about 8,000 ton CO2 equivalent. That's, that's a whole lot of uh, emissions. Uh, and like I said, that number is certainly wrong. But uh, for the sake of conversation, we'll use it today. Um, and that's one part of it. The other part is the actual energy use of the system, right? So we have a system that uses energy every day. The average monthly use over the first phase, so that's about a year, A1, the 1A phase was about 305 uh, milliwatt hour, megawatt hours uh, every month. And the average Dutch household uses about 2.81 in a year. So you can see how many households, that's, that's a lot. It's a lot of energy that's just going into this one system. And there's one, only one floor in a whole data center, right? So that this whole data center uses even more energy. Um, and then interestingly enough, uh, and that's also been a driver behind the machine learning uh, growth, right? Is that you can see, whereas uh, our GPU partition has the most theoretical performance, it actually loses, uses the least energy. So it's about five times more energy efficient to calculate something with the GPU as opposed to the CPU. So there is some interesting stuff in there, right? So that means that there's a value in building your system out of GPUs instead of CPUs. 
except for the fact that some scientific calculations need CPUs because of complicated math I don't understand. Um, but that's an, that's an interesting insight because um, uh, that means you uh, also have to already make choices about the system that you build, right? Because every part of it is a, a part of the impact that you eventually have as an organization. Um, so that's the, the, wait, can I go back? Uh, so this is the whole measured use. We just get a bill from the company that we rent the data space in, right? And they measure our energy use because obviously how are, else are they going to bill us? Um, so that's quite an accurate measurement. It's the measurement of the amount of energy that we actually use. Um, next to that, we have a energy aware runtime system which measures parts of the energy use that has some downsides about the accuracy, but allows us to see how much energy for specific uh, projects or calculations have used on their run, uh, uh, during the runtime, and also um, to see how it's used, for example. And then you get to really interesting insights. So um, on that user level, where a user uses a CPU on our node, um, on the whole average of the computer over a year time period, about 80% of the nodes are in use, so they are engaged in some sort of task. But only 40% of the performance is used in that same time, so that means they are used very inefficiently. That there is a lot of uh, time spent that that system is engaged, but not actually efficiently calculating. Um, so that has less led us to uh, um, um, realize we need to improve both our planning of the system use, but also training our own users in making efficient use of the research sources that they get access to. Uh, because what happens, that scaling and using a computing infrastructure for a researcher is hard. And if you have a grant uh, by the Dutch National Grant Authority that gives you, um, I don't know, 100,000 uh, points to calculate with, yeah, that you already have that grant, you know, why not spend it? It doesn't really matter how efficiently you spend it as long as you can do the thing you want to do. So we see there's a real incentive to not make use of the system effectively. Um, and so um, uh, we hope to include this sort of concept of energy in our uh, decision making also towards our uh, users to see, okay, can we improve your behavior and use of the system? Uh, and that's something my colleague uh, Sagar Dollas uh, works on. Uh, I added two links for who is interested, so if you're more on the technical side, we have a hybrid energy efficiency computing uh, workshop that you can join, it's free, so just putting that out there. <laughs> um, so that's the other element of this, right? It's about both sides of the equation, the use of the system and the system in itself. Um, so my question was, at some point with my colleagues, at what point does energy matter more than the hardware, right? Because we have the system that has a certain expenditure and a new system can apparently be more efficient than the previous system, in our case, more than five times. So you get more uh, science per watt. So that seems like a very environmentally friendly choice, right? Build a new system because then we use less energy and en less energy is less impact. But there was an inclination, okay, but the system itself also costs a lot of uh, uh, um, um, uh, impact. So how do those two compare? So what we did is um, uh, we compared the energy sources. So officially we pay for water energy, super green, as green as you can get. But in the Netherlands there is no water energy, right? So we probably, uh, our um, uh, data center uh, uh, provisioner has some sort of construction with these um, uh, certificates and all of that. But if we consider the energy impact of water energy, it's 0 0.004 kilograms CO2 per kilowatt hour. And you see that's negligible. You can hardly see the line of the amount of uh, um, um, CO2 impact that has every year. Whereas if you see the uh, energy, uh, the, the total impact of building the system divided by the amount of years that you run it, you see the system becomes cheaper every year and the energy stays negligible. However, if we use the Dutch standard grid mix, so the stuff that actually comes out of the, uh, um, out of the wall plug, right, we have a totally different story. Because here you see that uh, even though the um, impact of the system keeps going down, the longer you use it, um, the impact of uh, using the system is actually ginormous. It's about 10 times as, as much uh, emissions if you use the normal Dutch grid energy mix. For us, us, it's totally unclear what, which of the two we should use, for example, in our calculations. But it matters quite a bit, 
Because in the one case, I could argue with my colleagues, okay, we should let the system run for eight, maybe 10 years instead of six years, right? Because replacing it is quite an impactful event and the fact that it's not as efficient in using the energy, nah, that hardly, re hardly really matters. However, if you use the standard Dutch grid mix, the energy that it uses every year keeps compiling, keeps compiling, keeps compiling, so at some point it totally makes sense to replace the whole system. Of course, all of this is negating the need for peak performance and all of that, but it shows a difficult choice that you have to make when you try to do stuff more sustainable. And uh, that's not an easy choice. And uh, uh, I'm not saying I have the answers or my colleagues have the answers, but I think it's um, uh, important to realize it's in that nitty gritty that all kinds of decision makers try to figure out um, um, uh, what the system is doing. Uh, and this conclusion is sort of um, uh, mirrored in the uh, uh, Lucy Sioni et al. Uh, reference, where they compared also for Bloom and GPT, they see a lot of the uh, uh, energy emissions also coming from the energy depending on the grid mix. So because they are close, Bloom was trained close to a, um, a nuclear um, power station. They used the grid mix of the nuclear power station and as such came to about 50 uh, or uh, 30 tons carbon emissions, whereas GPT-3 uses standard grid mix and as such came to 500 tons carbon emissions. But they used the same amount of electricity right about, like the same um, uh, ballpark. So, oh yeah, and then did I, this I added last minute after our, the conversation yesterday. Of course, you need to change your slides uh, in the morning still. Uh, when we had this conversation about the impact of uh, uh, large language models, for example, GPT-3, having this 500 ton metric CO2 impact, and I think uh, we compared it at that time to a flight from somewhere to somewhere. So I was Googling a bit. Because if, to me, this is interesting, right? Uh, if you see a flight and it's about eight, 900 kilograms equivalent, it sounds Okay, that sounds bad, but Allah, if then a model training is about five, uh, 500 tons carbon emission, that sounds like a whole lot of difference. But then if you see how many people are actually on this flight and does calculate sort of the carbon Im impact of the whole flight, you see that actually a flight from London to the States is about similar to training GPT-3, right? So for me, that's an interesting realization that if you have an academic uh, conference in say, uh, Tokyo, I think, is next week, uh, philosophy of technology, um, that carbon emission of one conference can actually be equal to training a model. And that doesn't mean either one of them is better or worse, but I think it's an interesting realization to see sometimes it's easy to criticize that that is being measured, as opposed to that that isn't. Uh, similarly, we uh, did an experiment training GPT-3 on our own system, and we came to about 1.5 to 3 kilograms of CO2. Also sounds quite a bit but it's about the same as 200 grams of uh, meatballs during lunch, right? So all of these sort of emissions happen in all, diff all different uh, places. Then still, if you see like the total yearly impact of Snellius, uh, uh, it's uh, ginormous, right? And it depends on the uh, energy source. Uh, all the things with Baten and Excel, I obviously did this week in my Excel sheet, so don't uh, cite me on that. <laughs> um, so, there's a lot of uncertainties, right? Uh, where does your analysis start and where does it end? Um, how do you get uh, the right di data? Can you actually trust your supplier in supplying that or do you need to figure it out yourself? And all those estimations are so uncertain that can you ever really get to a good estimate of your uh, impact? These are all questions we ran into in this project. Um, energy is at least something we can measure. Um, uh, but then you have to the question, what is actually your CO2 impact? Because even for energy, that's quite unclear. Um, and then it eventually comes down to this question, when is it worthwhile to do something, right? Like if, if we have computation, for us it's easy. Grants get uh, um, uh, approved by the grant agency, then they get access to our system. So we have nothing to decide about how or what they do on our computer, but, uh, what they do, they do on our computer. But we can help with the how, right? Can we make their, them get more out, um, um, research, more science out of their uh, grants? So that's some of the things we look into. Can we get a baseline or a best practice? Um, lastly, really shortly, for us this comes up as a, as a value conflict. In the Netherlands, all the universities have come together to say, okay, we want to have a more autonomous and sovereign sector. Um, so we want to maybe build, uh, based on public values, a large language model for Dutch. And then you get this uh, uh, balance in between. Do you want to have a large language model because you 
you, you drive this sort of this, uh, autonomy and sovereignty, you want to get your hands on this technology and be part of the development, as opposed to the enormous impact building that thing is going to have. I don't think we have the answers to that, but it is the reality of trying to make these decisions, right, where you do not have the clear answers uh, uh, right away. Um, Next. <laughs> uh, so the last insight, it's not easy being green. Uh, what you measure is often what you optimize, uh, and that's not, often, not always what you want to optimize. And uh, um, uh, then all of that uh, relates to a more complex system of uh, uh, values. Uh, then one more next, and then I'm, I'm, I'm done. One more next. Yes, uh, you can download, oh, it's cut off. You could download the slides <laughs> um, uh, or reach out to me. There's a lot of questions still. Uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Perfect. Uh, thank you for... Okay. Perfect. Thank you for being so on time and for this interesting talk. Um, yeah, so are there any questions? Also for the Zoom audience, you can use the Q&A tool and we'll read all of your questions. Um, are there any from the audience so far? Yes, over there. Just uh, please wait till the microphone is uh, with you. Thank you, so the Zoom audience can follow. Um, yeah, so thank you for the, the talk. Um, when talking about the energy con consumption, you basically had those two, two sides of the picture. The one where everything would be green en energy and the other one is where you just take the energy out of the plug and you get whatever you're um, get, getting provided. Is there nothing like in, be, be in between you can use? Like for example, um, the uh, com computer is not critical infrastructure. So it would be uh, sufficient to have it run at times where uh, there is enough green energy to, to spare and then you can basically operate on those low costs maybe on um, yeah, paying the price that you can't run it 24-7 but maybe just run it when the uh, sun is shining or when the wind is, is blowing and you have then basically 100% green en energy, right? Uh, super interesting uh, thought. I think uh, in, in general indeed that's the issue also with these certificates, right? So in this case, we had water energy, which we obviously do not have in the Netherlands, but wind energy we do, and sun energy as well. So that could be quite an interesting uh, uh, question uh, uh, for us to look into, to see can we um, uh, modulate our uh, system use based on the energy availability. Um, I'm not sure if our data center currently supports that, but that's definitely a, an avenue of investigation. And I think interestingly enough, you see these sort of in this, uh, this, this discussion around energy impact that they usually now have as a best practice that you use the grid mix uh, uh, numbers if you cannot prove that you actually get the energy from that particular uh, station. Uh, so that's why, for example, the, the French national supercomputer, which is next to a uh, nuclear uh, uh, central, they have a really good case to show that their impact is what it is because they have a line coming from the center to their computer, so it's, there is no uh, um, uh, grid mix. Uh, but for us it's complicated, so um, yeah, I'm actually quite curious, I'll, I'll dive into that a bit, because, and yeah, 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 thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so Amy is next. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Duke. Um, really fascinating. I mean, I'm, blah, I have so many questions. Um, so I love, of course, I can understand why, why SURF is able to do this because, you know, they're not bound by IP and they're not um, worried about the public opinion of the organization because it's not a private entity and whatnot. Do you see um, interest from private companies to, to follow what you're doing, to do the same kind of things that you're doing? And then my second question is... Um, what would, like, uh, how, how do you start? How do you start making these decisions? So you've presented, you know, the problems and whatnot, and then um, is it up to you, or do you have to go to your bosses to say, like, this right. is what we're yeah. going to have to do? What, now yeah. what? Yeah, so I think for the first question, what is actually quite interesting is if you would compare Surf to large, like, uh, the Googles of the world, right? In general, they have this stuff sort of better figured out than us, but can not be as transparent, right? Because they 
yeah, they will just mark, share marketing numbers, right? The best possible scenario. Uh, I think a big problem, uh, if a big difference is that um, we have one system that's built for a very narrow purpose. And uh, now you see the growth of just these server farms for all loads of stuff, right? And that allows uh, it, the waters to be even murky, so murkier. So I've heard this story about maybe ChatGPT being trained on uh, uh, you know, all these Azure services in that 50% of the time that they're maybe utilized but not used, right? So then the question of what is their impact is actually even more complicated because it's using s systems that are just idling along. Um, so it's hard to compete with that efficiency that they have coming from that scale. So I think it's also really important for us to realize that we can have an open conversation about this. And I'm, I would also be very interested in collaborating on that with researchers here, like figuring this stuff out. And at the other hand, also realize it's not, it's not an equal playing ground. And not every organization can do as well as every other one because of this, these scaling effects. Um, uh, for us, what I think next is uh, uh, to continue this conversation. We're, we're hopefully getting a new uh, uh, su corporate sustainability officer soon, who can also drive this from a sort of policy side within our organization. And um, uh, I think one serious conversation that we need to have is about that element of these broader impacts, because currently we're completely focused on the energy. And the incentives are there. I mean, our energy bill is probably 100,000 euros a month at least. So if you can get that 20% down, that's a lot of public money that gets saved and can be used to something else. Um, so the next steps are definitely uh, uh, getting that conversation going and in a way that is uh, also constructive to the goal that we try to achieve with the system. So um, uh, it doesn't help us to be, um, um, uh, uh, for me to wag my fingers to watch my colleagues, we need to w look at it together and see, okay, how can we get to a future where we still have computational uh, abilities, we still can have researchers research climate, but do it in the best possible way. And one last question, real quick, and then, yeah. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, the, um, <clears throat> uh, thank you for pointing out the workshop, first of all. I'm going to forward that to a couple of people, because I think the whole um, question of how do we utilize a system when there's multiple users, multiple research groups who don't necessarily are trained in efficiency of their code or parallelization and so on and so on and so on is really um, a big one. Um, but uh, my question to you is uh, another one that on your slides you estimated, or at least the graph showed a 10-year life cycle of the system. Yeah. Uh, how long was the previous one running? And for example, if you say that the current generation of GPUs was five times more efficient energy-wise for the same computation that you could do on that, uh, we're seeing lots of new, like your A100 is going to be replaced by H100s and the next generation and the next generation. So what do you internally think? When is the right moment to switch currently? Or what's your policy on that? When do you go to the next generation of systems? Yeah, so, so this system is planned for uh, six years. And it has a couple of phases exactly also to help a bit with that element, right? So that we have one phase now. This is the one we talked about. We already built in November a phase 1B that I didn't include because it would make my life more complicated. Um, and then uh, phase 2 comes, phase 3 comes to also be able to be a little bit flexible and also for us to see uh, whether that demand for GPU grows because traditionally supercomputing has always been CPU uh, and that demand is growing so we're getting more GPUs. Um, um, and then after six years there's supposed to be a new one. So that's relatively uh, not a very long time, right? It, it feels quite short. In the past we have had systems that we had longer. So the previous Snellia system was 2013 till 2000. And 21 or 20, something like that. So it's about seven, eight years. And uh, the system before that, Huygens, we uh, even had to extend maintenance contracts with our suppliers because they, uh, and that's one of the issues, they stopped supporting the hardware, right? So you do not get any security updates anymore. And for us, dealing with all this kind of data, right, which might also be medical data for research projects, it's super important that we have uh, sec secure, yeah, good security of this system. Um, so we get to the case where you actually either have to uh, um, have extra maintenance contracts to keep it supported or um, uh, accept that you do not have up-to-date so software, which is for us unacceptable. So there's this policy element as well where um, um, these uh, uh, hardware suppliers, if they do not support the hardware for long enough, it actually is a reason for us to uh, uh, revise the system. Next to the fact that, of course, I mean, the computational needs grow and we also have a role to play in the marketplace, right? So we cannot 
decide to never update our system because then researchers are going to use AWS or Azure and then we lose every bit of public you know, computational uh, property that we have. So it's a, yeah, it's really a balancing of those values. Uh, I hope that answers your questions a little bit, but uh, yeah. Yeah, so once again, limited by capitalism. And one, um, <laughs> one last question from Benedetta. Hi. I guess she wants Hi. to react to yours. Yeah, slide. No, thank you. Thank you very much. These are exactly the kind of projects that we need, and we need to really get uh, connected globally and try to have more and more types of case studies like this. Like, one other thing that I wanted to ask you, well, I have many questions, obviously, and we can take them later. Yeah. But one of the, the question is, um, I'm sure you're familiar, familiar with the data that have been uh, popularized by MILA, you know, the Quebec AI Institute. And uh, actually, like, they, they speak about eight tons of uh, carbon emission for each GP, um, chat GPT model. Oh, right. right. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? And it's, yeah. Uh, it's different. It's 8,000 kilograms, right? Yeah. So I wonder if you have an idea of why, you know, their calculations are so different. And if you are thinking of developing a similar tool, like the very highly, you know, successful tool that they, it's open source, it's available to, to everybody, which is an ML calculator of carbon emission. Yeah. And, you know, if you're interested, I have all links and you can easily access them. So I'm interested in understanding as a non-computer uh, yeah, yeah, uh, sure, scientist me. person um, to the differences. And the other point I wanted to make is that, like, um, we are running a similar project on um, high-performance computing, right, with this group at QOT and, uh, and uh, at Sydney. And uh, one of the problems we have is also calculating where um, the server providers are is highly impacting also on the overall um, uh, computational data that we achieve. And, and this is very often a big deal because universities are not so open about where they're actually getting all their, um, their power, all their computational power. So I wonder if you have a similar issue. And the last point, is about um, uh, yeah. Is about um, like trying to see um, how easy it is, in your view, to um, to develop this benchmark for data scientists. Because you know, once you're assigned your log, you're also assigned the type of quantity of computational power you need, right? So you know that. So and you you possibly can also estimate that maybe you need less of that. And how can we make that, you know, uh, in, a, in a sort of a practice, you know, that becomes a routine of all of you working with data? Thank you. Three great questions. I uh, really like the, 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 the way this, this conversation is going. I, I, I really conv I try to convince some of my technical colleagues to join the conference as well, but it's all, yeah, in general, they are not very fond of traveling for work, so, you know, sadly, they are not here. But I hope to bring them next year, maybe. But, uh, uh, so the first question, about calculating these emissions, right? We have this uh, energy-aware runtime system that we co-develop with, I think, a university in Barcelona, but I don't know by heart, which is a system specifically aimed at, for our sort of HPC, uh, high-performance computing applications to measure this. And that's, I think, part one, that we can measure it, uh, uh, because then we can uh, um, uh, better estimate it and better uh, uh, guide it. Then I think the second question, now, I think of the third question, I forgot the second one. But the third question being more like, okay, what then can we do with that, right? How can we help? Uh, I think one element is that we are growing this consciousness that we have a responsibility there. So our own machine learning engineers that support scientists, they actually get annoyed with scientists, right? Because they haven't prepared their stuff well. They uh, uh, hog uh, a machine for like a whole day without really doing something useful. So we, we start at least getting that feeling, right? That's the first beginning, right? A little bit of annoyance. And we hope to get a play, to a place where we can do it in policy. And our current holy grail on the short term would, would be that we have the uh, a requirement from the funding agency, NWO, that if they use our system, I would love that they uh, would have to have a declaration of energy use. So that if they have a publication, yes, yeah, it says a small footnote, this used this amount it's a of watts. The idea of a green label or certificate, yeah. 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 So exactly. So that's the, yeah. Oh yeah. I'm very sorry. And the I other have one to will push do, you uh, over. Maybe you can discuss during lunch more. Yeah. It sounds like you have a lot of, to talk about. <laughs> so um, thank you, Duke. This was an amazing presentation. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.